Good morning and greetings to you from South Carolina for those who are attending the annual meeting of the Society for Historic Archaeology Conference Live. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person for this very important session, um, brilliantly organized by Luann, Karen, and Sarah, but I'm hoping in years to come that we'll all be able to get together again in person and uh, share our reminiscences of Mary and uh, you know, just talk through what it was like to work with her both as an advisor, professional colleague, and friend. So with that, I'll launch into my paper here. Journey Without Maps is the title of one of Graham Greene's few nonfiction works, and fit appropriately for this reflection on Mary as a friend, an advisor, and what I've learned and continue to learn from her work. Green's journey was taken in 1935 through approximately 315 miles of Liberia's hinterland, which was largely unexplored. The few maps of the area which existed at the time were either mostly blank or else so wildly inaccurate as to be useless. Green made his journey without any, opening his narrative to the unexpected and deviating from his original intentions of destinations. To complete his work, Green's reliance on storytelling and his lived experience to interpret his Liberian adventure resulted in one of the more complete and compelling visions of Africa before World War II. In the course of working with Mary as a PhD advisee, field archaeologist, and friend, our many conversations delved into interests outside of archaeology or paths we wanted to take or anticipated that we would. On more than one occasion, writing and striving for clear, readable prose would come up, and Green was invoked a time or two as one who had attained the gold standard. In another conversation that I thought was going to be a serious discussion about my qualifying exams, the result was a merry monologue about how she wanted to be an Africanist. This was a fascinating revelation to learn. I don't know why I expected that she had gone in the direction she wanted to, but this got me thinking about how approaches for us to gain entry into archaeology and the routes and courses that we take in our professional careers. In my experience, and from what I learned from Mary, having that map to follow is rarely one that we have access to, and more often than not, it's those less traveled paths that aren't on the maps with colleagues to help guide us along the way. What follows is less a traditional paper and observations on my interactions with Mary. I'm certainly not in a position to be a biographer, and this is left to colleagues in this session who knew her longer and worked through collaborative projects or publications. This has been one of the more challenging pieces of writing I have yet put together, and I'm sure like many of you, that the news of Mary's passing came as a huge shock during a period when it wasn't safe to gather in a group as we might have liked, and the annual SHA was virtual. Grief is a universal experience, and when we can connect it is better, and I sincerely hope that that's the outcome of what this session will be. During a semester in the grad program at BU, I served as a TA for Archaeology 101. Great Discoveries in Archaeology, which was taught by a Mayanist who liked to take grad students out of their comfort zones and teach the classes where the content was about as far from one's course of study as possible. In my case, I drew Minoan civilization as my first lecture. I knew nothing about how to begin to approach a lecture on this for 300 undergrads and feel confident that I was a subject matter expert. To give myself some semblance of legitimacy, I opened the class session by tracing my archaeology genealogy. I began by introducing myself and where I had come from, connected my path to Bill Kelso, connected his to Ivor Noel Hume, to Mortimer Wheeler, to Arthur Evans, and finally terminating with Augustus Pitt Rivers. Can't argue with training with a training lineage going back to the guy who rediscovered and reinterpreted Knossos, I thought, right? At this stage in 2008, I had been in the grad program at Boston University for one year. I had 10 years of field archeology span behind me. I knew how to excavate well and had solid backing and artifact identification. 
My, under, my undergrad background was history, not anthropology, as many of those in my cohort had studied. Theory to me was a four letter word, hence my genealogical trail, which mostly consisted of field archeologists, but Mary was quick to help rectify that. I also thought that during this period in time that I had my career map well in hand and I knew what the course would be. I wanted to return to Western Pennsylvania where I had grown up and focus on finding and excavating military outposts built by the French in the middle of the 18th century. This map soon was abandoned. Those that knew Mary can likely visualize the disinterested look followed by the pointed question, what exactly do you hope to learn from that? I'm not gonna try my best Mary Beaudry impression at this time in this recording. I confess I had no good answer and still don't, other than that was the history that was familiar to me and I was comfortable with it. I think one of the big takeaways from graduate school is that you learn how to deal with discomfort, both mentally and physically, which is exactly what one needs to finish the dissertation. And Mary definitely knew that and was quite willing to put you out of your comfort zone. As I state, Mary was quite artful in doling out the discomfort from uncomfortable conversations to pushing writing in ways that I often felt I was not up to the task or from pointing out the obvious when it had been missed. I recall when I had arrived at the topic that would ultimately become my dissertation, underpinned by the archaeological biography of 17th century Virginia and Massachusetts settler Daniel Gookin, I went into an advising session with Mary full of excitement and giving her a summary of the subject. I couldn't tell why I was getting such a disinterested look. When I finished laying out what I intended to do, she said, I'm sure that you do know that I already know who Daniel Gookin was from my earlier publication. I didn't, and she certainly knew that. But with this interaction, she pointed me to her 2008 chapter in, from In Small Worlds, Method and Meaning in Microhistory. Her above vulgar economy piece remains one of my favorite works that clearly articulates the craft and importance in archeological interpretation of storytelling. And it did a lot to help me get comfortable with methods I felt I could use successfully and ultimately did deploy it successfully, uh, thanks to her. When the two of us agreed upon what my path to the dissertation might look like, Mary strongly encouraged me to add an international research component which ended up taking me to Ireland to trace the archeological biographies of long dead and forgotten people, which is something that she excelled at. This was a formative experience for me in field and archival research that would not have been possible without Mary's support, not only from the academic encouragement and helping me to navigate the red tape of funding, but something much more important and long lasting, introducing me to new colleagues. While conducting research in Ireland, Mary also got me involved for a few seasons on Montserrat, where I got to experience working with her in the field. Several of the people that I met during this period are in this session, uh, either in person or virtually as well. And that important support network is one that I continuously rely upon in my professional and personal careers. These off the map punctuations helped shape my way of archeological thinking and turned it into a more holistic approach. And again, for that, I credit Mary with helping me to do. While there are professional and personal connections made through Mary's help, one of the most important in my life was made indirectly, uh, that of my wife, Casey. In 2004, Casey was an undergrad in the archeology span department at BU and Mary was her advisor. At that point, Casey's research aspirations centered on the lost colony of Roanoke, and she needed a field school in order to be able to satisfy the undergraduate requirements. Mary recommended Jamestown, where I was on the archeology span staff. Casey and I met, our relationship developed from there, and Casey returned to BU, finished her undergrad, 
and came to Virginia for work in archaeology. When we both started looking at graduate school, we looked into four different programs, but at the end of our search, the Boston University Archaeology Department offered the best funding for me, and the Historic Preservation Program, also at BU, likewise for Casey. While I cannot be sure, I think Mary may have had something to do with this. And though she declined the invitation to attend our wedding in 2008, the three of us became close friends. Even after both Casey and I finished our respective programs, Mary continued to provide advice and support in our careers. And that critical support is one that I will truly miss. In mid-2019, my path shifted out of a director of archaeology position at Mount Vernon to that of a more curatorial role in the museums of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, operating two museums at the Jamestown Settlement and the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown, where I knew I would have to work to make archaeological research a new component of the programming if I wanted to stay involved. I wasn't sure how Mary might feel about this particular career move, but as it turned out, the professional network came into play again. I ended up in the same department as Ed Ayers as his supervisor, one of Mary's friends and colleagues from the William and Mary days. Ed and Mary had both worked on the excavations at Yorktown and stayed in touch. And in subsequent conversation, it was clear that there was much to do to clean up the archeological record of the field work and how this would benefit the Yorktown Museum and future scholarship on the important collections that were excavated under the direction of Norman Barca in the 1970s. The three of us talked about the possibility of Mary spending some time to work with Ed on this after his retirement, and she was genuinely excited about the prospect, as was I, as this would have been a different opportunity to work with Mary in ways that I hadn't, uh, both as an advisee, but in a more professional role on, on parody as well. Uh, and I'm sorry that that couldn't come to fruition. As I close out this reflection, I want to restate the importance of the people that we meet on our career paths and not on the maps that we make and we try to navigate. On my own journey without maps, I've gone from Virginia to Massachusetts back to Virginia and now to South Carolina, where I am the director of archeology span at Drayton Hall. This is kind of an odd twist because when I entered the BU program, uh, I feel that what I was interested in and the theories that I knew in archeology span were radically different from where Mary ultimately was and she took me in a completely different direction uh, for me. Um, Pattern analysis was key and uh, something that I was able to get behind. And now I, I can't think more of the opposite. So it's interesting to be in South Carolina. This last move was the first job I've gotten in 14 years where I didn't seek Mary's advice or was able to ask her to serve as a reference. And I am convinced that it was her support towards helping me finish the dissertation and the subsequent network that got me here. While I have not gotten into personal interests with what we mutually shared, I'll end with just one. Mary shared the love of baseball and sometimes the Red Sox with many, myself included. In ticket lotteries for Sox games, I would always try to max out the number that I could buy, which was a stingy, paltry four tickets. And all told, we attended five games during the time that I spent in Boston. The last game I went to with her was her treat. It was an afternoon game in May against the Minnesota Twins. As Mary was not much of a beer drinker, when we entered Fenway, we had to walk for a bit to find the lone premium beer stand. When we got up to the counter, the bartender commented in the best Southie accent that uh, I think I've ever heard. And I'm not going to try to replicate that. Ah, oh, that's nice. You're taking your mod to the ballpark. Not one to keep silent. Mary confused him by telling him that she was not my mother, but my academic mother. Probably the greatest honor that I've ever gotten and one that I'll never forget. 
So until the time when we can all get together again, and I guess this is the one lone benefit to pre-recording a conversation, pour yourself your favorite dram and raise it to Mary. Thanks. Hope to see you all in person again soon.